live from Anarcho Popco. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet and as well on the Dollar Vigilante channel because we're going to be talking a lot about expatriation. I'm here with Nathan Freeman in beautiful Acapulco, Mexico, also known as Anarcapoco. And uh, Nathan moved down with his entire family to Acapulco. And uh, a lot of people have a lot of questions about moving, getting outside of the US or wherever they're from. And uh, Nathan's got a lot of great information on that. Uh, but before we get into that, I have to uh, make sure that you're a morally sound and consistent person, how did you become an anarchist? Um, well, I first read Ayn Rand in uh, high school and uh, very much identified with objectivism for a long time. Um, and I stuck with that nice square circle of minarchism for a lot of years. And then one day I was on YouTube and I came across this video called The Story of Your Enslavement by Stephen Molyneux. And I was just blown out of my chair, <laughs> as I think a lot of people are. Um, and I still wasn't entirely sold on anarchism until I saw a different presentation of his called The Future is Nothing Like the Past. And if you've never seen it, it's really great. But the essence of, of his case uh, in that particular speech was that you can't focus on the how of anarchy because it, none of it will make any sense when it actually happens anyway. If you talk to somebody in the 1840s about abolishing slavery and they said, well, how will you pick the cotton? And you say, oh, that's, don't worry about it, no problem. We'll have these giant metal robots and they'll just go through the cotton fields and they'll have little robotic arms and they'll pluck the cotton and they'll just pick all the cotton out and they'll eat the cotton and then they'll shit shirts out the back. <laughs> Everybody would go. That's not an answer. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Just that's just crazy. And, and, but that's the reality. That's really what happened, you know? And, and so you can't, you can't predict, you can't predict the, the projection of the future like that. Yeah. Um, and that really spoke to me as a technologist. And once I heard that, I was sold. You know, stop worrying about the hows, the, the where will everything be, what's gonna work, and just focus on the moral argument um, because that's really the important part. Yeah, that is the important part, is the moral part, and that's uh, the part that I'm all about. And uh, it is interesting with uh, anarchy, a lot, we get asked all the time, how would things work? You know, how would it work without, if the government wasn't in charge of medical care, which just happened in the U.S. like a year or two ago, and now people don't know how it could even work without it. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people come up with a lot of great answers, but the truth is the market always finds a way. If there's a need for something, that people need something, uh, they will find a way to get it. And that includes the roads, which is always one of the big ones. Uh, people, for some reason, seem to think if there was no extortion uh, via taxation, uh, that uh, there's no way we could have flat surfaces that we could drive cars on. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's qu quite interesting for people who, who are, uh, don't really understand uh, what we're talking about as far as anarchy. Uh, but the market takes care of everything and it does it much more efficient. It's not perfect, of course, uh, but uh, uh, th anything that needs to be done will be done by the market. Before we uh, moved here to Acapulco uh, many years ago, right after we got married, my wife and I lived in Johannesburg, South Africa for a while. And um, <clears throat> they have actually a very private medical system there as well. Um, and we didn't have any kind of uh, insurance coverage or anything. And she ended up in getting in a really bad car accident. She uh, collided with a bus and uh, totaled the car, ended up taking a, an ambulance to a private hospital, um, has spent a night in the ICU, uh, spent a week in a private room with a bed, had um, had to have some reconstructive surgery on her uh, on part of her face to to fix some of the damage that happened and uh, we paid cash for the whole thing it was eight thousand dollars for the entire <laughs> the entire stay and all of the all the medical services including the ambulance ride um, and I just like picturing that in the US so oh. it would be 80,000, if not minimum, more. Yeah. Minimum. Uh, I would guesstimate actually hundreds of thousands based on what I see uh, lately. And a lot of that's because of the fascism in the U.S. So people say, oh, we need to socialize the medical system in the U.S. because it's so expensive. But that is expensive because of the fascism, because of all the regulations and the government involvement and everything. 
And that's one interesting thing about Mexico, and a lot of people ask this question too, about if I, if I leave the US, you know, uh, what would happen if I get sick or something? And a lot of people really want this medical insurance and stuff, and I've never had medical insurance my whole life, and the only thing I always hope is I hope I don't have a major problem when I'm in the US, because it'll bankrupt me. Uh, but down here in Mexico, uh, I was sick once. Uh, I had a really bad stomach bug, and I'm a typical guy. I won't go to the doctor or the hospital until I'm pretty much dead. And it, that's what happened. I was lying in my bed. I, I couldn't move at all. I was so dehydrated from, uh, you know, a stomach bugs. So I was just always just diarrhea. Just I couldn't keep anything in me. And um, <clears throat> finally, I got to the point I couldn't even move. And my wife said, "That's it. I'm taking you to the hospital." And I asked her, oh, uh, which hospital? And she said, well, there's like 15 or 20 in Acapulco. Uh, take your pick. And she said, uh, one's free, but you don't want to go to that one. Uh, it's not very good. Uh, and she said, a bunch are really cheap. They're pretty good. The middle range ones are, are really good. And then if you really want to spend a lot of money, you get the best ever. You can spend a lot if you want. So you have all those options here. And I chose the middle of the road one. And it was the exact same experience for me. I had a private, as soon as I entered the hospital, I was the only person there. And a uh, private room, flat screen TV, doctors looking at me. There must have been 10 doctors looked at me during the entire time. I was there for two days. And the total cost was around $1,000. <laughs> So, and all kinds of lab tests and all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's totally different um, once you get outside of the US and uh, socialized medical care. Um, so uh, a lot of people are very interested in um, getting outside of the US. They're very scared about it as well. And then one of the reasons I have this on the Dollar Vigilante is because we have something called TDV groups, uh, which is groups of mostly libertarian, anarchists, minarchists, at the very most uh, sort of people uh, who have expatriated around the world we've got people all over the world and one of the biggest groups actually I think the biggest is here in Acapulco and uh, so there's a great um support uh, sort of uh, uh, that you can get through those groups, as you know. Uh, so first of all, why don't you tell us about what made you decide to leave Georgia and why did you choose to come here to Acapulco? Well, there were a lot of reasons to leave. Um, the biggest one is that my kids are now getting old enough where if we stay in the U.S., we have to start going through all the government regulation, all the government registration processes. Um, and I just I couldn't stand the idea of asking the government for permission to teach my own children. <laughs> right? just, there was no way I was going to send them to a public school. No. I'd send my children to the set of a porn movie before I'd send them to a public school in the U.S. Um, but, uh, but even trying to do homeschooling or unschooling um, is just really oppressive. I mean, you have to ask for permission. And once you start through that process, you have to keep asking permission for basically their entire childhood. Um, and, you know, you make a slip, they come and take your kids away. And it just wasn't the kind of risk that I was willing to take. Um, so we knew we wanted to get out of the U.S. Um, and uh, we had, when, we, when we lived in Johannesburg, um, we had a, a generally positive experience with the idea of living outside the US, but we made the mistake of moving to a place where we didn't know anyone. And that made us very isolated. Um, the, the fact that most people speak English there did help, so we were able to make some friends, but we were still pretty isolated. Um, and when we came down for an Acapulco 2015, it was with an eye of evaluating Acapulco as, as a possibility of, of a place to move. And we just loved it. It was just, I mean, we loved the people we met, we loved the atmosphere, we loved um, the fact that the kids basically spent six hours a day in the pool <laughs> and had a blast. Um, and, uh, and the nights were a lot of fun. Um, and you know, part of that was the conference itself. Um, but when we decided that we were ready to move, we, we wanted to go to a place where we actually knew some people this time. And, um, and we didn't know too many people. We knew maybe five or six, but it was enough. Uh, it was enough to make that choice, and um, and now, you know, every day or well, probably every week, there's somebody new arriving, um, and it's just that little expat group of uh, of upholders of the NAP just keeps getting larger and larger, and um, and we have regular meetups, and uh, you know, we we go out and and break bread together, and and um, we uh, we help each other out with a lot of different um, a lot of different. Uh, barters and favors and that sort of thing. Uh, so, um, like with, there's one member of that group that's, uh, she speaks six languages. 
Um, so there's a number of us who are taking Spanish lessons from her now. Uh, she also acts as a translator when we need. Um, we have, uh, there's one guy who's a Romanian guy who's a tailor. Um, and uh, he's, actually, he's actually making a set of custom drapes for all the rooms in my house for me, um, which he did in exchange for me buying him a sewing machine so he could do it. <laughs> so, um, so there's a lot of like little things like that where um, we, we happen to have a car. A lot of folks here, a lot of the expats who have moved here don't, don't yet have cars. So we'll give a lot of people rides. Um, and it's just a sort of voluntarist association of all of us just doing nice things for each other and, and helping each other get through um, being strangers in, in a land. And not necessarily a strange land, but. Yeah, it's great to have that kind of support network. And there's so, many, so much of that here in Acapulco. I don't know how many people have moved down now, but it's quite a few. And so as you mentioned, it seems every week there's someone else just pops up. And uh, we have groups on the Dollar Vigilante. It's $15 a month for a subscription. And you can get access to all the groups. And one of the groups is the Acapulco group, which uh, I know you're meeting up with later tonight. Uh, they meet about once a week. And uh, there's always some sort of business uh, being discussed, uh, some people working on things together. I know you're thinking about providing uh, internet uh, via microwave, uh, possibly with some other people? Yeah, there's a, there were some people that I met at Anarchopulco who run wireless ISPs in various parts of North America. Um, and we've been talking about working together on starting one here. And it so happens that my house is, has great coverage for, for wireless over a good portion of, of the city. So um, they're gonna be, uh, I think early December uh, is when we're gonna start some, some experiments with all that. And um, there'll probably be radio towers up here that we install right here at the house. And um, we're really looking forward to trying that out. Yeah, and you can, uh, Jose, you can pan around and just show the rocks here. This is all part of Nathan's house. And that's uh, where you can see it. it's so interesting. Acapulco's got such an interesting uh, uh, things. So this house is built right into the rocks. So what Nathan's talking about is possibly putting up a microwave dish up there and, and providing uh, high speed internet uh, throughout most of the bay because you can see most of the bay from here. So uh, lots of interesting uh, opportunities and things. And let's talk about the cost of uh, living here and what the lifestyle is like. Uh, we're sitting here in your house right now. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see behind, but your patio is about the size of uh, a hockey rink almost <laughs> uh, overlooking this this view um, and as we just shown uh, it's built all into the rocks it's really interesting design which is what I find a lot in Acapulco because they don't really have the regulations and stuff so people just build stuff how they want to build it oh, so yeah. if there's a rock there they just build into it you don't have to ask anybody or anything uh, so talk a little bit about the uh, lifestyle and and the and the cost of living like how, uh, rentals and, and things like that sure um, one of the challenges that we had before we moved at all was um, living in the States, you, you have an expectation of, of frictionless commerce when it comes to things like renting a house. Right? You go on Craigslist or, or one other, some other internet service and um, you just find all the listings you could ever want. A little bit different here. Uh, there's not really that kind of um, centralization and, and frictionless uh, commerce. Um, what you have to do is come here and then just drive around or walk around and look. Um, and if you speak Spanish, it'll be a no-brainer. If you need somebody to translate for you, then you have to find, and, and there's plenty of people within that TDV group uh, who are fluent in Spanish, and you have to find somebody to accompany you. And you can literally just walk around and see, um, see renta signs uh, all over the place. Um, there are local newspapers and local sites uh, that are in Spanish that also have uh, some really good resources. Um, we looked at about, I think about 10 or 12 places. Um, and this one wasn't our first choice. We were actually going to live not far from you. Um, but uh, we ended up, that, that negotiation fell through on, on what they wanted for that price. Um, but we found this place and it was like, oh, this is what we settled for. <laughs> and so um, I pay uh, my rent in Bitcoin at the moment, which is really great. Um, it ended up being easy for me to set up an account for my landlord on a Bitcoin exchange here that where I can do transfer, I can sell Bitcoin for pesos and do direct bank transfers in pesos. Uh, and it's, it's nice to have that seamless transition there. Um, but for this place, I think uh, US, uh, it's about 2,500 a month that we're paying now. 
Um, and we have two families here because my, my parents also retired and moved with us about six weeks after we moved down. Um, so between the two, they were living near us in, uh, back in Georgia. Between the two, we were paying around, I think, 3100 a month in rent for two houses. So we ended up saving some money when we got this place. And it's, it's pretty extravagant, but um, we enjoy it. Yeah, there's a heat massive house. Uh, you know, you can get lost in here. It's got all kinds of, uh, you know, it's got statues and everything. And uh, great location too, right in the middle of the bay. And uh, there's lots of uh, amazing places to rent. And actually the price that you're paying is, is uh, quite on the high end. Uh, a lot of people have moved here and gotten apartments for around $300 a month, which are very nice. Well, there's a, there's a, a nice condo that's right up around the corner from where we are, uh, where I think there's now uh, four different uh, other, other expats who are part of that group living. Um, and they have great two bedroom and three bedroom uh, units there that I think started like 400 a month US. I mean, they're, they're really, really inexpensive. Um, and they've, getting, they've gotten great deals over there. So, and it was just a matter of, you know, finding the right people uh, who know the area, know the market, who are already here. And that was very easily done through, through the Facebook group. Yeah, and that's a, a real a key reason to get into those groups if you're thinking about moving somewhere. And uh, because uh, so many people, uh, I know a number of people in the group here in Acapulco have already sourced out a number of rentals available because people are always coming into town and, and it is a little difficult. There is no real great site, and, and actually I'm putting one together right now, being an entrepreneur, a real estate site to tell you about places you can buy and also uh, rentals. I'm hoping to work with some people in the group and help uh, when people come into town find them the rental they want and I know a uh, number of people have already done that Angel Clark has helped a number of people find some places I, I believe and the peso is dropping so much that uh, when Angel Clark first moved here she was so excited that she uh, uh, was um, going to get a, a beautiful two-bedroom apartment with a, a view of the bay sort of like this for about $500 a month but with the peso having dropped recently I think she's paying about $350 a month right now so it's a great time to uh, come down and move to a place like this now a big question a lot of people have is with families because that's always a lot harder uh, I've traveled the world I've lived in so many different countries but I was always by myself and that's so so much different than when you've got you know a couple of kids and a wife behind you and you know uh, a lot harder to do it that way. Uh, so how have you found that uh, the move with the family and how has the family enjoyed the, the, the move? Well, first off, the, the biggest fans of, of our move have been our kids. Um, they love it here. Um, they, uh, you know, they spend all day in the pool or playing or learning. Um, so that's not terribly different from home, except we didn't have a pool. <laughs> so that's a nice addition. Um, but they really like it. And uh, my wife absolutely adores it. Um, she feels so much safer here than she Which ever did back Which is funny, right? Because the first question that most people say, well, well, I'm thinking about moving to Mexico. It's like, oh, I heard it's dangerous. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> it's because, I, like, I, I don't think I've ever felt safer anywhere. Um, and it's... And this is supposed to be one of the most dangerous cities in Mexico. Well, I, I suppose if I was a, a cartel drug dealer, I would have something to be worried about, but otherwise... Yeah, they leave the tourists alone, uh, and uh, this entire area is a very touristy area. So yeah, this really, I, I don't feel, uh, uh, I feel much safer here than in most places in the U.S. where you see just cops on every corner, and I always, almost always get arrested in the U.S. for something, just, you know, something small, like walking outside of a bar with a drink in my hand. Uh, I got arrested in Phoenix for that. Uh, I got arrested for walking down the street and I looked drunk, the cop said. Uh, and I was drunk, <laughs> well, you but were. you know, not falling down <laughs> drunk. I was just buzzed and I had just left the bar to go to another bar. And uh, five squad cars in Palm Springs surrounded me, handcuffs again. Uh, that sort of thing just doesn't happen down here. Well, there, there's nobody to do it. <laughs> and even the traffic cops are, um, they're not even armed uh, most of the time. So it's sort of like, there's, there's one guy in the, in the expat group who is um, probably a little bit bolder than most of us in, in that regard. Um, and he just actively tells the, the traffic police when they pull him over, he's like, nope, piss off. I'm not giving you anything. I don't have any money. Just go away. And they just do. <laughs> they just go away. And it's like, okay. And if you want, you know, if you, if you feel like you're not bold enough to do that, so you want to pay him a bribe, 
okay, so it costs you 10, 20 bucks. You know, it's not, it, it's, it would be a $250 ticket plus insurance premiums in the States. And oh, here yeah. it's, you know, 20 bucks, leave me alone <laughs> and you're done. Yeah, and a lot of uh, uh, people have uh, paid a, a little bit to the cops. And But uh, it's funny here in Acapulco, it's interesting. I talk to the locals and I say, hey, a friend of mine got pulled over the other day. Are the transit cops back? Because they were gone for almost a year. They, they went on strike and everyone decided we don't want them. But so, then they had an election, then they put them back in. So whoever won the election decided, all right, I'm going to rehire all these, all my friends to be transit cops. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, it's just pretty funny how you, a lot of the people in Acapulco, they actually, uh, they say, oh, you should give them a couple bucks because they don't make much money. So if they do pull you over, <laughs> uh, the standard sort of tip you give them, or, or actually charity, is, is about 50 to 100 pesos, uh, which is like three to six, seven dollars. And, um, and a lot of people here do it almost out of charity. It's, it's, it's a totally different dynamic than the police state yeah, in the US. absolutely. And it's actually funny because I, the first time I got pulled over the first and only time I got pulled over. Um, I, I was really scared and I was scrambling for every peso I could find and ended up giving the guy like 600 pesos. And a couple of hours later, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a hotel manager here. And, uh, and I told him that and he goes, oh no, don't ever do that. And I'm like, what's the big deal? And he goes, you, once you do that, they start telling their friends and your car is marked. <laughs> and they'll, they'll just be like, yeah, just pull this guy over and say whatever <laughs> and tell him you're gonna take his car and all this stuff. And he'll give you 600 pesos and you'll be great. You, you know, go drink that night. He's like, never, never more than 100. And it should be more like 50. And so, pesos. <laughs> yeah, so, pesos, pesos, yeah, so not dollars. A couple of dollars, really. Uh, I even knew one guy, he got pulled over once and uh, got talking to the cop and he said, hey, I'm, let's go to, there's a bar down the street. I'll buy you a couple of beers. How about that? And, and the cop said, okay. <laughs> so he went to the, to the bar with the cop. So that's sort of the, the way it is down here. Uh, one other thing we should touch on that we touched on earlier that a lot of people uh, are really interested in is uh, homeschooling, unschooling. Uh, and of course, uh, if you're into homeschooling or unschooling, that makes it so much easier to uh, travel around. Um, uh, my kids actually do go to a school here. They go to a Montessori school. Apparently there's four of them in Acapulco. I didn't even know that. And I believe we go to the best one and I think it's around 350 to $400 a month. Uh, and uh, they love it. They absolutely love it. I, I, I think homeschooling is awesome and I, I really like unschooling as well, but my kids, they're, they're still pretty young uh, and they like to go and play with the other kids right. at the school and stuff. Uh, but if they ever want to stop going, that's great. It'll save me 400 bucks a month and then uh, I'll get them working in a restaurant or something right. as a waiter or waitress at 10 years old, which actually I brought up with my kids. Um, I mentioned that uh, my wife wants to open a small restaurant and uh, my kids want to work there. My son really wants to wash dishes, but I think <laughs> after a couple of days he's yeah, gonna probably, not probably like not it as much. That. and my daughter's really excited about being a waitress because I told her you make tips so then the better service you do and the nicer you are the more you smile the more money you make and she's a little cutie she's nine years old so she'll probably do well and have a lot of work experience before she's even 10 or 11 years old so you can't do that in the US either of course that's child labor we'd be in jail for I don't even know how long, and they take our kids away into, and probably put them with families who will rape or kill them oh, half the time. I try not to think about that yeah, too much. Yeah, me either. It's terrible what they do up there. Um, and so just for people to know as well, uh, I think Acapulco is a great place to, uh, uh, to invest in, in property at this moment in time. It's uh, uh, still quite cheap, and I think it's going to do a lot better over the next few years. And I started up a real estate site. It's still not live. It might be live by the time we put this up. I think we called it Paradise Acapulco Real Estate. Uh, so if you don't see it up when you check this out, check it in a week or two, and it should be up. And we have a bunch of listings for some uh, just amazing, beautiful houses that you can't even believe the prices of them. Uh, it's just so much cheaper than in the U.S. Oh, yeah, and then, you know, the other costs are a lot cheaper. I think the only thing, the two things that I found that are definitively more expensive here than in the U.S. are shoes and electronics. Yeah. Gas is a little more expensive. It's, it's, not, too, it's not too bad. Um, but uh, everything else, food is incredibly cheap. Um, even prepared food in a restaurant is just, it's just dirt cheap, if, unless you go to someplace that's specifically expensive. Um, you can, there's a, right down on the corner, there's a taco stand. Every you, corner has a taco stand. I know. <laughs> and you can get 10 tacos for 70 pesos. It's 50 cents a taco. I'm like, how, how can you beat that? And they, may, they make them right in front of you and everything. It's, and it's delicious. Um, and, you know, don't believe the rumors. It's quite safe. I mean, 
there's nothing you're not going to get. I think I, I think out of our whole family, I'm the only one that's had any kind of a stomach bug illness uh, the whole time we've been here. I had it one time, and I, I'm sure it was just something that I hadn't encountered before that now that I've had, we won't have to worry about it again. Yeah, that happens sometimes if you're not from a certain area. This is very tropical, and if you're not from a tropical area, you might not be used to some sort of the type of bugs that live in that area, so you can get sick that way. But the whole uh, don't drink the water in Mexico and all that sort of thing is way overblown. If anything, it's uh, just as good or better here because they don't put fluoride in the water. Well, the other thing, too, is that if you, if you say, well, you have to drink bottled water all the time, here, that hardly matters. There are guys that drive up and down the street in water delivery trucks, and you just run out and you wave 30 pesos at them, and they bring it into your house for you. <laughs> um, and these are the big, the big 20 liter canisters like you would have at a water cooler in, in your office in the States. Um, and you can go to uh, any supermarket and buy bottled water, and it's a fraction of what it is in the US. I mean, I, I, get a, I can get a, a six pack of one liter bottled water for like 22 pesos. It's like a dollar fifty. Yeah, and that would be one bottle in the US if I was lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you're lucky, yeah. Yeah, the costs uh, can be very uh, much cheaper here. As you pointed out, some things aren't uh, uh, cheap, like electronics, because the government, unfortunately there is a government, they don't do a lot, but one of the things they do is put uh, quite a few big uh, tariffs on uh, incoming electronics. So if you're into, you know, a lot of people will, I, I, someone's just moving here uh, in the next week or so, I believe, I forget who it was, and so they made sure they bought a laptop in the U.S. where it's a lot cheaper, and even newer as well. They, a lot of times they'll have they'll be about <clears throat> six months or a year behind on some of the technology here in Acapulco anyway if you're in Mexico City you can get pretty much anything you can get in the US but Acapulco is a bit of a just a tourist sort of port town so it doesn't have you know giant Best Buy or anything they have Best Buy in Mexico City and things like that um, but we do have Home Depot Sam's oh Walmart. yeah no, a lot of things that people are used to they have here there's Walmart and, uh, and Walmart's totally different than in the US I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> you know I, I watched like that uh, website the people of Walmart in the US and it's like holy cow it looks like a third world you know <laughs> bizarre poor country and here in Walmart uh, some of the time and uh, one of the times I went in they had girls in bikinis uh, and they're all playing music and they were offering free beer to people if you wanted to have a beer while you shopped uh, and so uh, yeah they have Walmart Sam's Club uh, of course McDonald's if you want that uh, all the stuff that uh, there's not a lot of things that they don't have here that uh, most people would miss and I, I don't eat hamburgers, so I haven't tried the McDonald's here, but my parents do. And they say it's actually a better hamburger here in Mexico. I'm, I'm sure they've sourced the beef much better here. Yeah, I've actually found, uh, I do eat McDonald's about once a month on average. Uh, just one of those things, I, I grew up on it really. Uh, and so it's just so, something that I just sort of crave from time to time. So I've eaten at McDonald's around the world and the best McDonald's by far is in Germany. Uh, it comes out like a work of art. It's, it's like perfect, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's, and it tastes really good and really fresh. Uh, but here in Mexico, I agree, it's better than in the US. Uh, I've eaten here at the one in Acapulco and it's quite good and uh, uh, so yeah there's really no, not a lot of downsides to uh, moving to a place like Acapulco and we should uh, talk a little bit about an Acapulco you were at the ver first one yes uh, which was in February and uh, sort of an interesting story from that one I think I've told this story before somewhere but uh, I had uh, made a mistake and booked a hotel that had really crappy internet and we didn't make that mistake for the coming year we've already checked out the internet and it's much much better but one of the interesting things about it was we're having a narcopoco and an narco capitalist conference and you and a few other people were working on their internet and, and uh, trying to upgrade their systems while you were at the conference yeah we you know um we don't turn to authorities to solve our problems. We solve them ourselves. And literally, we just went around and, and tried to figure out what was going wrong with their, with their Wi-Fi. Um, and at the end of the day, what we actually found out was that they, they had messed up the installation of every single access point. They had 72 access points in the building. And they had literally taken the access points out of the box and just stuck them on the ceiling. So for those who understand anything about routing and network technology and routing technology, uh, every access point in the entire building had the same IP address, which does not make for a happy network. <laughs> um, so in order to fix it, we actually had to take them all down from the ceiling and plug a laptop into them and reconfigure them one by one to make them addressable from the rest of the network. Um, and so we just started doing that. 
<laughs> and we were walking around the hotel, taking them off the ceiling and plugging them in. And uh, after a while, um, security showed up. <laughs> and, and so um, we had to explain that we were, in fact, fixing the problem rather than, than causing or making anything any worse. Yeah, it's an anarcho-capitalist conference. That's the kind of people we are. We, we fix things. We're not like anarcho-communists where we go and, and break, them. break, break things. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I hate the Wi-Fi here and just smash it off the ceiling. You know, that would be that'd be sort of the traditional anarchist, right? The the, the mainstream well, version. What, what people think of yeah. it, yeah. And it was kind of funny because after the conference, they were a little worried. First of all, I said the name of the conference was, and I said it really fast, Narco Poco, and they thought I said Narco Poco, which of course <laughs> is the drug sort of thing. And they were really scared. I said, no, 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 Anarcho Poco, it's just anarchist. And the woman said, oh, anarchist, that's fine. And uh, she told us after the conference that we were the best conference they've ever had at the hotel. And part of it is because we were all fixing, helping out to make their, their systems better. And I don't know if you charge them or not, but that's it, uh, it's sort of a typical business opportunity in Mexico. Uh, if, uh, you, if you see something like that, why, you know, it was Copacabana Hotel. They have a fairly big hotel. I'm sure if uh, a person went up and said, hey, your internet doesn't work at all. I'm sure you've heard complaints and uh, you can tell by the staff they hear complaints all the time. Uh, I can fix it for you for two or three thousand dollars. It'll take me a couple of days or whatever. Just do what you did. And I'm sure they'd go for it because it, I, have a, I have a proposal into them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> the owner's evaluating it now, but it's a bit more than $3,000. I charge them my U.S. rate. Yeah, but still, uh, those are the sort of opportunities you just don't see in the U.S. Uh, just the ability to just quickly find some business. And uh, not a lot of uh, 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 companies here even have websites. That's a big one uh, for someone looking for uh, opportunities. Uh, there's, they're just way behind on getting websites uh, for the companies down here. And a lot of the websites they do have are pretty crappy. So, uh, you know, you can go around a lot of these businesses and, uh, and, ch and charge them $500 to do a WordPress template website and do one of those every day and you're doing pretty good. A lot of them are not, um, are not uh, on things like Google Maps as well. Yeah. Um, so even knowing how to get them on with a correct address would actually probably have a big impact on the amount of tourist business that they're actually getting. Um, that was actually a suggestion I made to one of the members of the group was you know, offer, don't just offer to put up a website, offer to put up a bilingual website um, and let them get some gringo tourists in there as well. Yeah, a lot of the uh, uh, websites are in Spanish only. Uh, pe there is people, of course, in Acapulco who speak English, but uh, it's not uh, like Cancun or Cabo where everyone speaks a lot more English. Uh, but you can get by here without speaking Spanish. Oh yeah, it's, um, that actually hasn't been a huge problem. Um, I mean, if, when we wanted to do things like uh, get cable internet, um, we took a translator for that. Um, but just sort of everyday things, like we go to the supermarket almost every day, and um, it's just very easy to just gesture at what you need, and, and after a while you learn the, the patterns of, of what's going on. So I don't necessarily know what the cashier is saying to me, but I know what she would normally say at that time, and it just happens to be a repeat of, of, of how it worked before. Um, Probably one of, the, one of the strangest cultural things that's local is um, a lot of places that you go, you pay for parking. And that's not a big deal, it's used very cheap, but um, every place seems to handle the way they process that differently. So like you'll go to one place and you have to get a ticket when you first drive into <laughs> the parking lot and then you hand it to the cashier. And, and they hand you a receipt that has something on it, and then other places you have to get it stamped <laughs> and pay on the way out, and other places you have to just pay on the way out, and other places, that gets very confusing. <laughs> um, this is a problem only people with vehicles have, of course, but <laughs> it's I should it point out, though, too, challenge. though, that uh, it's also, I find it much better in those terms than the U.S. because all the street parking, uh, there's no meters in all of Acapulco. There's one street that has meters and it has the old pesos on it. If you want to put anything in there, it's mostly as a joke uh, because it only takes like a, uh, it's less than one peso coin, I believe. So like, oh, wow, that's hard to find. Yeah, the, you know those little fifty cents <laughs> yeah. or whatever they I are. I lose them all the time. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I was on this one street that has uh, parking meters uh, once, and I saw the meters, and they were hilarious to look at. They're so beat up; they're like forty years old. And I saw the amount, and I put in one of those fifty fifty cents, which is what like three cents, so like three pennies essentially, and it gave me two hours. And not that it mattered because there's no cops come around and ticket you. <laughs> no one, there is no ticketing. No. 
yeah. uh, here. Uh, so yeah, it's, and then uh, when you park on the street as well, there's almost always on most major main streets, there's usually a guy and that's his street and he usually works on that street and he watches your car for you. If you want, he'll wash your car for you. Uh, he'll help you back out. And usually you just drop him like, I usually give him uh, five to 10 pesos every time. Uh, so about around 50 cents, uh, sometimes a dollar. And uh, they actually watch your car for you and uh, they're always on the street. They know every car, you know, and uh, and so that's the kind of service you get as opposed to the US where of course it's just signs everywhere. If you do anything wrong, a, a woman comes up and $300 on your windshield. Oh, yeah. and or they just tow it or boot or it. tow it, boot it, yeah. Uh, they have nothing like that down here. It's such, such a better lifestyle. So for people interested in uh, finding out more about this lifestyle, uh, definitely check out Anarchapocos, which we just announced is finally live. There's a website. You can register right now at anarchapoco.com. Uh, it's going to be February 19th, 21st. Uh, going to be just over there at a new hotel, which is much, much better, called the uh, Grand Hotel, which has really good internet. And uh, we're expecting easily hundreds and maybe as many as a thousand or more people coming down. So it's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of great speakers, Doug Casey, Jeffrey Tucker, Adam Kokesh, Bob Murphy. Uh, I keep adding uh, speakers all the time. We're going to add a lot more too. <clears throat> and one of the uh, things that I noticed at the first in Arcapoco that a lot of people had a question about was uh, what we're doing this video on today. Uh, what's it like to move down here and stuff like that. So there's a possibility we might have you speak on it or at the very least be on a panel to talk about your experience in moving to Acapulco. Poco. Yeah, well, I've, I'll be at the conference, um, and of course, anybody can buy me a tequila and find out anything they want to know. <laughs> well, as long as I know it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was last year was just brilliant. Um, we had such a great time. Um, everybody would be gathered around the pool talking until three in the morning. Um, uh, in fact, some people actually went out and went for a swim after that, and and they watch the sun rise over the mountains uh, from the ocean. Um, just, a, just a tremendous time that everybody had. And, and a lot of the sessions were really amazing. The speakers were amazing. Um, and I, I think it's going to be even better this year, um, or the coming year. Well, I know it's going to be better because I did the first one and I'm doing the next one. And <laughs> the first one was really off the cuff sort of thing. I wasn't expecting a lot of people to come down. I thought, oh, maybe there'll be 50 people or 100 people. So I don't need to really worry about it too much. And it ended up selling out at about 300 people. And so we were scrambling a little bit because I wasn't prepared for that. And I'd never ran a conference before. So uh, I, we learned a lot from that one. So the next one is going to be uh, better in every respect. So if you think about coming down, definitely check that out. Uh, so we should leave it. Uh, at that, is there anything else that you wanted to mention while we're here? Well, uh, yeah, I did want to talk a, just a little bit about um, some of the mechanics that we went through in actually making the move. Um, because the, the number one thing that we heard when we would tell people that we were moving is they, they'd sort of look wistfully and go, oh, I wish I could do that. And of course, we'd respond, well, of course you can, <laughs> right? If we can do it, what one man can do, another man can do. If we can do it, you can do it. Um, and, and it actually, the, the process was pretty amazing. Um, the first thing we had to do was we talked to, uh, I talked to my business partners. They were completely supportive. Um, and uh, we talked to our family. They were not as supportive, but they eventually got on board. And of course now move, have moved down here as well. Um, and, uh, and then we just started making a plan. And the, the first step of the plan was to sell everything we owned. And uh, that sounds really scary. It sounded really scary to me. I mean, it's just like, what? <laughs> but, but I've worked for years and years to accumulate all this stuff. What do, what do you mean sell it all? Um, and one of the most surprising things was how liberating that was. Um, we just, we hired a company to do, that does estate sales and they come in and they took a 30% commission and um, they just ran what's basically a giant garage sale out of the house. And they, we literally sold everything that was in our house. I, I think we had, we had like five or six suitcases full of stuff that we ended up packing up into our van. Um, but everything else was just gone. And um, we made, like they gave me an estimate on what they were gonna make and I didn't believe them. I'm like, you're out of your mind. And they met the target. I was really stunned. Um, so, um, so we left with quite a bit of money and with a great feeling of freedom from our stuff. You know, because when you think about moving to a place and you're thinking about taking all your stuff, well, that becomes the real, the logistical nightmare. Right. How do I get my stuff there? And people spend, you know, 
ten, twenty thousand dollars on putting everything in a container and shipping it to a place, and what you're shipping is a bunch of stuff that you don't really need. So if you sort of let go of that and get rid of it all, then you can feel a much more profound sense of freedom when you get to where you're going, because everything that you need to have is already with you, and you know it's portable. If we wanted to leave and go someplace else tomorrow, we know that everything we've got can go into our van and we're, we're all set to go. Yeah, and one of the great things about uh, Mexico, or uh, Acapulco at least, is pretty much every house that you rent or even buy comes fully furnished. Oh yeah, I'm not sure I ever want to own furniture again. Yeah. It's so not such a nice idea to not have to move it around. Yeah, I've never even seen a moving truck here. People, when they move, they just leave all, they, they don't take their couch and their beds and stuff, they just leave it. And uh, I think it's better uh, to be dragging all this stuff all over the place all the time. And, uh, and uh, as I pointed out, almost every place that you rent or by it comes almost completely furnished. I'm talking flat screen TVs in a lot of these places and and uh, really nice furniture if you rent a nice place. Uh, all this, I'm sure you didn't buy this patio furniture. Oh no, and, and this place came with four king size beds and and uh, two flat screens and there you I mean, go. it's very well outfitted um, and uh, it was it's spectacular. I mean, it's just a great way to be able to move into a place. It's, it's almost like moving into a hotel, only it's your own. Um, so that's that's a really nice a really nice difference. And I know you have things like uh, maid comes in from time to time, three times a week actually. <laughs> it's it's very inexpensive, um, and uh, and she comes in and for six hours scrubs the whole house from from top to bottom. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. We actually um, the 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 woman that we're renting the house from had her here already, and we gave her a raise once we moved in um, just because. We felt like you know she wasn't quite making enough, and and we were probably a little me a little messier with the kids than than who had lived here before. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just great, and and we have a pool guy that comes three times a week as well. So I, we're not doing any pool maintenance. Uh, that's all outsourced and and very very inexpensive. Um, I think our pool service is thirty dollars a month U.S for three times a week. I mean, so lucky, like that'd be like one visits. visit. Yeah, yeah so it like makes one. about a dollar fifty a visit, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and there's other things like I have a cook, uh, pay him about $12 a day, so uh, we don't cook our own food. We have a full-time maid, uh, that's about $12 a day. So our house is always pretty much completely clean, even with kids and five dogs. Uh, we have a driver, uh, so he takes him to the to the school about twelve dollars a day, maybe a bit more for him. I'm not sure. My wife takes care of the logistics, um, but uh, yeah, you can live such a, a much easier life down here if oh, you yeah. have some sort of income or some sort of uh, money. But uh, there's plenty of people who are part of this expat group who also don't have money. You know, who who are um, who are just still in the early stages of their career. Um, and but they're still living very well. You know, they they have uh, clean, comfortable places to live. Um, they're able to to go out. They're able to dine out. Um, they're able to to have a social life. Um, and it's it's not like you know the you have the image of the U.S. college kid or the U.S. like recent graduate either moving back in with their parents or getting some crappy apartment where five of them are living and they're sleeping in shifts and they're eating nothing but ramen noodles and. Um, it's just, you know, even the people at the beginning of their career here, they, they're, they're living quite well and they're, and they're very comfortable. Yeah, and uh, one thing I w want to mention is you said how freeing it was to get rid of your stuff. Um, I've always been a minimalist. I rarely have much more than what I need. I have my stuff for business, a camera and computers and things like that, and I need the c computer for the internet and stuff like that, but I really have no uh, real uh, material possessions. Uh, but I did it in the past have a fair amount, and I was living on a boat, and I had all my stuff on it, and I sank the boat in El Salvador, and uh, so I literally had nothing, like nothing. I was wearing just shorts that looked like this, and that's all I had, and uh, it felt great. It felt amazing. Uh, I, I find that the more you own, the, uh, the more that stuff owns you. I, I never believed that aphorism until we sold all our stuff, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I get it now. That, I see where that comes from. Yeah, it's very liberating, uh, which a lot of anarchists might like. So we should wrap it up at that. Uh, did you have anything else you wanted to mention before no, that's, we do? No, that, that'll do. I hope um, people who see this will, will come to an Arcapulco 2016. And um, if you want to talk more about this there, then uh, absolutely I'm willing to, to sit down and talk with anybody at all about any of this stuff. And if you join the TDV uh, Acapulco group, 
then um, I'm pretty active there. And there's a lot of others who are also quite active uh, who are completely willing to share this information um, and will help anybody out who wants to get down here. Yeah, that's great. And we have groups, like I said, all over the world. So if Acapulco is not for you, uh, we've got groups in, I think, about 50 different countries. And they're all similar in that they'll help you out. They they like-minded people. They, they want to help you. And a lot of them are expats who are entrepreneurs who are doing business. You might even find some business opportunities. So that's just the Dollar Vigilante. Just go to dollarvigilante.com slash subscribe. $15 a month uh, and you get access to these groups. And the Acapulco group is just amazing. It's uh, got so many people on it. and. Uh, so many uh, great ideas and people working on things and, and getting together. It's really great. So, uh, yeah, and if you're interested in just uh, checking out uh, uh, life outside of the U.S., if you've never left or, or uh, traveled too much, uh, check out Anarcapoco coming up February 19th to 21st, uh, right over there on the beach. Uh, so that's for Anarchast and TDV. Uh, so I'll sign off with both. Uh, peace, love, and anarchy, and stay safe out there. When you consider that you have to spend all your time basically unteaching what your kids just learned. <laughs> so not only must the government recognize natural rights, but the government can't disparage them. Unfortunately, the people in the government have a hold in their copy uh, where the Second Amendment is, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. So, you know, this is not so saintly. I mean, you know, because he's got the reputation of favoring, uh, you know, ending slavery. But he wasn't an opponent of slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were opponent of slavery, but not Abe Lincoln. I mean, the actual argument and the explanation is pretty darn simple. I mean, it's, it's so simple as to almost be self-evident. I mean, things like self-ownership and the non-aggression principle, it's, it takes about three seconds to demonstrate that government can't be legitimate. Well, I, th I think uh, human beings have the right to shape their own reality. And that's what's been taken away from us. We are participating involuntarily in a system that shapes our reality for us. And the first step is to not allow that. You're paying off your debt, you have to pay off your car loans, your mortgage, you have to maybe even live with your parents, and then you look back at your life and you did nothing. You never challenged yourself, you never experienced anything, you never lived your life because you kept doing what the machine told you to do. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.